Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's special guest is a member of one of the world's greatest and most beloved vocal groups of all time, the Manhattan Transfer. They are renowned for their trademark jazz-infused harmonies and their stylistic range, which allows them to embrace a wide variety of musical styles in such an authentic, innovative, and unparalleled way. They've achieved an incomparable catalog of 30 best-selling albums featuring many hit songs, including Operator. Chanson d'amour. Twilight Zone. The Boy from New York City. Trickle, trickle. Route 66. If you ever plan to go to West, travel my way, take that highway, that's the best. Get your kicks on Route 66. And my personal favorite featuring our guest as lead singer, Quantame. The Manhattan Transfer has won a jaw-dropping 11 Grammy Awards, and they were the first vocal group to win Grammy Awards in the pop and jazz categories in one year. They are one of only four artists to have won seven consecutive Grammy Awards for seven consecutive studio albums. And in 1985, they received 12 Grammy nominations for their most highly acclaimed album, Vocalese, at the time, making it second only to Michael Jackson's Thriller as the most Grammy-nominated album of all time. Their music spans the pop, jazz, and dance charts, and their greatest hits album, The Very Best of the Manhattan Transfer, continues to hold a top spot on the iTunes jazz chart almost 30 years after it was released, which certainly demonstrates how enduring, timeless, and relevant their music continues to be. In 1998, the Manhattan Transfer was inducted into the Vocal Group Hall of Fame, and they've received two prestigious honorary doctorate degrees. This year, they're celebrating their 50th anniversary with a new album entitled 50, which just got nominated for a Grammy, and they're on a worldwide farewell tour. Our guest is not only a founding member of the Manhattan Transfer, he's also released two solo albums and is a highly acclaimed songwriter, arranger, and vocal coach. I'm beyond thrilled to welcome the fabulous Alan Paul to our show. Alan, thank you so much for being here. You're welcome. My pleasure. Would you like to be our publicist? Any time. <laughs> Alan, I've been a fan from the very beginning, and I've seen you perform in concert many times. And what really distinguishes the Manhattan Transfer for me is that you can't be categorized. You're not a jazz group. You're not a pop group. You're not a swing group or an acapella group. You're a vocal group 
with eclectic musical styles. Whose decision was that to not allow yourselves to be locked into one genre? It was our decision in the beginning. You know, we were all eclectic in a way. We had a lot of different musical influences, especially growing up in the New York metropolitan area for Tim Hauser, Regina Siegel, and myself, and Laurel Massey at the time. And we didn't want to label ourselves. We wanted, you know, we loved all these different styles of music. So we wanted to keep our, our, our music open and apply our sound to different genres. Well, before we go into more detail about the Manhattan transfer, I just have to mention the fact that you made your Broadway debut at the age of 12 in the original mm -hmm. cast of Oliver, and you were the original Teen Angel and Johnny Casino in the Broadway production of Grease, directed by my friend Tom Moore, who recently appeared on our show. What made you decide to leave musical theater and become part of a vocal group? Well, you know, it was never in my radar to be in a vocal group. You know, I had always been on my own. And it was while I was in Greece, Laurel Massé was dating the drummer in Greece. So I used to see her backstage all the time. And I always loved swing music. I always loved the vocal groups, you know, doo-wop groups and, and the big band groups. I always loved that. But I never thought about being in a group. But Tim Hauser was driving a taxi. It's like a it's like a, a C movie. And he was driving a taxi and he picked up Laurel one night and they were talking and Laurel was waitressing, but she was a singer and he, he was working on a demo. He asked her if she would uh, sing on it. She said, yes. Another night he picked up a conga player. They were talking. He invited Tim to this party for uh, Nashville singer, Diane Davison. And Janice was singing backup for her. She had a group called Laurel Canyon and they were, and they were singing backup. And Tim asked the same question. Would you uh, sing uh, on my demo for Spec? And she said, yeah, why not? So she and Laurel met. And then one night, Laurel said to me, well, you know, the guys in the band, in the Grease band are doing a gig, you know, which a lot of musicians would do. After Broadway musicians, they would go and, and they would do a gig in a club. So I went down to see the guys and Laurel and Janice were singing. And it was the first time I ever heard them. And they blew me away. They were just so incredible. Laurel had this impeccable pitch. And she was like a flute. She was so strong. And so what a beautiful tone she had. And Janice did a solo. I remember she sang uh, Aretha Franklin's Dr. Feelgood. 19 years old. And she just had this amazing voice. And then uh, a couple of weeks after that, Laurel approached me and said, listen, that girl Janice and I and this other guy are putting together a group and thought maybe you'd be interested, you know, uh, because she knew that I had I'd gone to uh, uh, university and I studied music and I'm into a lot of different music. So I went down to meet Janice and Tim and it was within that period of two hours that I decided to be in the group because of the concept of the group doing four part closed harmony, like, like big bands and the whole concept of, of how we saw music changing. 1972, Vietnam was over. All the clubs in uh, New York that were folk clubs turned into cabarets. There was a major change going on. And I was kind of bored doing the show, doing the same thing every night. And whenever I would try and do something a little bit different, our dear friend, Tom, I'd always get a note from Tom, don't change anything, just, just do the same thing. Because uh, yeah, if I, if I tried something new, it would throw everybody else off. So anyway, I said, well, you know what? This is a great idea. It's unique. It's not like anything that anybody else is doing. It sounds like it would be a lot of fun. So that was it. Is it true that Bette Midler's manager was the one who facilitated your introduction to Atlantic Records, where the group got its first recording contract? Yes. Yes. Wow. Um, you know, we had been around for uh, about two and a half years by that time. And we were playing in the village. You know, we were selling out. We had a, you know, a really good 
rep, but we couldn't get a record deal. And we had everybody come down, you know, from every major record company, they would come down, usually middle management, usually guys, the A&R guys or whatever that, you know, they said, I just don't know what to do with them. You know, they're like in the middle. I don't think they're commercial. You know, if I sign them and it doesn't work out, I get fired a lot of times. So it didn't happen. And, and Bet was a friend of ours through Tim. And we ran into Bet and Aaron one night at, at, a, at a club. And so we were sitting and talking and Aaron said, how are you doing? How's everything going? And we told him what was happening. We said, we just can't get a record deal. He said, well, let me know, you know, if you need any help. And the next day we, we called him on the phone and we said, help. And so a week after that, we were playing at the Bijou Cafe in, in Philadelphia. And Aaron called and he said, hold the show. We were doing two, two shows a night. Martin Mole was opening for us. And he said, hold the show and bring somebody down. And so we kept telling Martin, hey, extend, extend, Martin. Okay, you know, so we did the second show. And then after the show, he comes backstage and he brings Ahmed Erdogan. Ahmed was the founder, CEO, head of Atlantic Records. And that was it. That's kind of how it happened. He okay. got us and he signed us. I first remember falling in love with the group in 1975 when you had a TV variety show on CBS replacing Cher for the summer. I just loved it. And I could not understand why the show wasn't renewed. Do you know why? Yes. Because we didn't want to do it. Oh. We didn't want to do the show. They actually were offering, it, it, you know, Cher, it was a summer replacement. We did four one-hour specials. And there was some conflict within it. You know, we had our set of writers, Joel Silver, the producer, who was not at that time the diehard producer, but he was one of our writers. Fayette Hauser, who was uh, Tim's sister. Bruce Falanche was one of our writers. And they were coming up with absolutely brilliant stuff for us. But the producers also had their set of writers and they were basically gag writers. And they were going into, you know, they, they wanted us to, you know, there was a character on there called Dougie Duck, a guy who would come out and, and act as a duck, you know, and we were going, oh God, do we really have to do this? We don't, you know, why don't we, you know, just so it was really kind of split. But the real reason why we didn't want to do it, because it was at that time, for the most part, if you were a TV celebrity, you couldn't get played on the radio. There was an absolute split between. And we were really concerned about that. We wanted to be recording artists. You know, we didn't want to be TV artists. So that was the main reason why we didn't do it. Your song, Chanson d'Amour, became a huge number one hit in Europe. Was that a surprise to you guys? Completely. Really? It was absolutely, completely a surprise. You know, Chanson d'Amour, we did that on our coming out album, our, our second album, yeah. produced by Richard Perry. And it was a, it came in very late. It was one of the last songs that we, that we recorded. And 1977, we went over to Europe to do a tour. And we were absolutely surprised to find out that Chanson d'Amour was number one in uh, England, number one in France. It, it, it spread that whole summer we went over. It was huge. And we were like superstars. And we had no idea about that at all. Well, it's easy to know why the song is magic, still magic. I want to take you back, Alan, to 1980, the first time you and the group appeared at the Grammy Awards, you came up on a hydraulic lift at Radio City Music Hall. You could see Michael Jackson, Madonna, Barry Manilow sitting in the front row. What was going through your mind? We were just, I think, a little overwhelmed, surprised. I mean, that, that we were there. It, it, it happened so fast in a way. 
Uh, especially because it was 1980, the album Extensions was the first album that Cheryl Benteen was on. So Laurel had left the group because she was in a, a very bad car accident and couldn't continue. So for us, that was a major transition doing that, that album. You know, we really changed our music and uh, coming up, seeing all those people out there, it was like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm up here on this stage. <laughs> well, all your fans were so, so excited for you. And then there was another moment, monumental moment for you at the 1983 Grammys. I'll never forget this. The Manhattan Transfer sang How High the Moon with Ella Fitzgerald. You absolutely blew everybody away. It was jaw-droppingly fabulous. That must have been a major highlight for you. Absolutely. I mean, Ella for all of us is uh, is a hero. I mean, she was our idol, you know, especially I think for Janice, especially for Janice. And, you know, we, during the day, it was really the, the most magical, amazing time because we were there with Ella and, you know, she was just so sweet. You know, by this time she really couldn't see very well. So I was taking Ella by, by the hand and walking her around to where she needed to go, you know. And then when we did the rehearsal, we sang. And then Ella turns to us and said, was that okay? And we're looking at her and, and we're thinking, Ella Fitzgerald is asking us if that's okay. It's like, yeah, it, it, it's, I would think it's probably the highest point of our career that we did that with her. To meet well, her. I hope you know how proud your fans were of you that night because it was magical. I'll never forget it. I have to ask you, Alan, about one of my favorite Manhattan Transfer albums. It's called Tonin. And you sing with a lot of guest stars like Frankie Valli, Bette Midler, Smokey Robinson, Phil Collins, Chaka Khan, James Taylor, so many more. I absolutely love that album. Were you actually in the studio with all those people when you were recording those songs? I'm sorry to say that we weren't, we were there for some of their sessions. Uh, Smokey Robinson, we were in there. B.B. King, we were there. Ruth Brown, we were in there. Phil Collins, we were in there. But a lot of it, it was timing. You know, it was, the, the album was produced by Arif Mardin, who is, was legendary. I mean, he actually produced the, the, the Young Rascals. He produced the original Groovin you know, that I did with Felix Cavallari, which was uh, amazing, you know. And, but it was a matter of timing because we were out on the road, we were touring, and, you know, Arif was, was just, he kept rolling. I remember he had to fly to Miami to record Bet because she was on tour as well. And it wound up being the most expensive album that we ever made. I think it costs almost a million dollars to make that album just to get put all the pieces together and everything else. But it, it was amazing. Frankie Valley is still a dear friend. You know? He is an icon. He's a legend. And one of these days I'm going to get him on the show. You'll see. Yeah. Now, you know, of course, in a 50 year period, there's bound to be some difficult and even traumatic times. You mentioned already 1978, Laurel Mass had to leave the group after a serious car accident. Cheryl Benteen has had very serious health problems. And then, of course, in 2014, we lost the brilliant Tim Hauser, who was the driving force behind the group and who brought all of you together in the first place. But throughout all of that, Alan, you've kept the group going, which is really monumental, don't you think? I I think so. Uh, I mean, as to, uh, as far as groups are concerned, I think the fact that we've managed to stay together for fifty years, and that's continuous. Every year we would go out and we would tour, for the exception of COVID time when we couldn't uh, perform for eighteen months. But yeah, and and we owe that to our fans. 
that keep wanting to come and see us, especially in the beginning with Atlantic Records, because they, you know, Ahmed, we were Ahmed's group, Ahmed Erdogan's group, and he he really supported us and he allowed us freedom. You're talking about eclecticism before. He allowed us to explore. He allowed, he trusted us to keep trying different things, you know, very, very uh, grateful and, and very fortunate. Well, I think keeping the group alive and bringing Trist Curlis into the group was the greatest way to honor Tim's memory. Do you still feel Tim's energy and presence when you perform on stage? Absolutely. Every single night. You know, the group wouldn't be here if it wasn't if it wasn't for Tim, you know, in the beginning. This in the beginning, especially this was his dream. This was his idea, his concept, you know, to do this. You know, I think that as we evolved, you know. I think we, it became more of our united vision in terms of where we went and what we wanted to do. But every night, you know, we always pay homage to Tim. Yeah. Yeah, And I know that the fans in the audience are feeling exactly the same thing. Your latest album, 50, just got nominated for a Grammy for Best Jazz Vocal Album. Alan, congratulations. You must be so excited. We are. Yes. Uh, The album was challenging. It was a very complex album to do because we did it during COVID. And just to give you a little story on it, we, uh, 2019, we had done a concert with the WDR Funk House Orchestra in Cologne. And it was such a wonderful experience that we talked about doing a project together, you know, and they wanted to do it and we wanted to do it. And then COVID hit. And then the idea got shelved for, uh, you know, till the following year when we started talking about it. And then when we finally started working it, you know, deciding what we were going to sing, picking arrangers, orchestrators, our band, we couldn't get together to do. Originally, we were going to go to Germany, and we were going to do this thing together, but we had to do it in sections. And amazingly, it all came together. Oh, it sure did. There's there's brand new songs. There's new versions of some of your favorites. You've got a symphony orchestra. What a special way to honor Tim and to commemorate your 50th anniversary. It's just brilliant. And to get this Grammy nomination, which I have a feeling is going to turn into a Grammy win, is, I mean, what a way to cap off 50 years in the business. You're in the middle of an extensive world tour at the moment, and you've announced that it's the Manhattan Transfer's farewell tour. I have trouble even saying that. Why Mm. is this the last tour, Alan? Touring is just getting more challenging. It's getting harder to do that, especially internationally. It's just very difficult. So that's why we decided to not tour anymore, not do that. We'll still be together. We'll still still do special things. But, you know, I think for health reasons, it's just, it's just too hard. You know, we're not 30 years old anymore. You, you know? look it. Uh, well, that's very kind of you. Well, uh, I've had the thrill of seeing you perform in concert every time you've appeared here in Toronto. Your shows are fabulous. What's been the best part of touring for you? Getting up on the stage and and performing without a question. You know, all the schleppage, you know, all of the the traveling and everything else. The payoff is being able to walk out on, on the stage and perform. And have that that interchange with with our fans. Absolutely, you know. It's, not only the it's fans; funny. it's the children of the fans. It's the grandchildren of the fans. Yeah. This is the kind of music that's timeless. I mean, the thing about the Manhattan Transfer that really amazes me is that you can play your very first album today, and it sounds current. It's not. It doesn't age. It's not dated ever. Yeah. So just to be clear, you're not going to tour anymore, but you will continue to record and perform in America? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're going to do things, special things, but we're, you know, we just don't, 
we can't do the the touring anymore. It's a little it's a little hard. So yeah. Well, Alan, in our remaining few minutes, I want to ask you about your two solo albums, starting with Another Place in Time. It's a collection of standards, including Stardust, How Little We Know, I'm a Fool to Care, with beautiful orchestral and big band arrangements. How did you go about selecting the songs for that album? Well, it was a collaboration I did with Peer Music. Peer Music is a independent publishing house they take care of all my publishing and it was their 75th anniversary and so uh, we collaborated on that and so i picked out of their catalog songs that i lo- that i loved and that's how we did that for anyone watching if you have not heard and obtained the two albums that alan paul has recorded you got to get them the second album is shoebop which pays tribute to classic doo-wop and pop music from the 50s and early 60s. Your voice on that album is very reminiscent of the Platters, Dion and the Belmonts, Jackie Wilson, all those great crooners of the era. So of course I have to ask you, Alan, who were the vocalists that inspired you as a kid? They were. So I have listed on there, I, I pay tribute to singers or groups that, that really had an influence on me. You know, Dion from Dion of the Belmonts, the Platters, the Velours, which is kind of obscure. They were East Coast and they were like, they did a, a tune called Can I Come Over Tonight? And the uniqueness of, of that recording was the, the soprano, the, the uh, falsetto, and also the bass. And I had on, on the album Street Corner Renaissance, a wonderful vocal group out here in, in Los Angeles, and they recorded with me. Also on the album, who else did I have? Definitely Jackie Wilson. Oh, my God. I remember when I was a kid and I would watch Jackie Wilson perform. You know, I'd see him on the Ed Sullivan show. And I mean, he was such a dynamic entertainer, but he had, he had an operatic voice. I mean, his voice was just incredible. So I really wanted to pay homage to him. Also on the album are a couple of cuts that I had done with Ray Ellis. Ray Ellis was a, uh, he was the head of MGM. He was also a wonderful orchestrator and arranger and producer. And he had done. He did uh, the Lady in Satin album with Billie Holiday. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. What was that experience like? Well, he told me about that, the album and, and how difficult it was at that point in her life, you know. But the album, I think out of, out of all the albums that, that she ever recorded, that's probably the most vulnerable it's the deepest album, but the thing uh, about his arranging on it, he had a certain sound, you know, that I wanted to capture, that I wanted to record. And I had, he, he would use three women that would double up the strings. And it was a very ethereal sound, his, his arranging. And I went on a hunt looking for him or trying to find somebody that could replicate Ray Ellis. And finally, I found him. I didn't know if he was living or not, but I found him uh, up in Ojai. He was retired. He wasn't doing it anymore. And I convinced him to come and and to do three songs for me. And it was absolutely, uh, it was just one of the greatest thrills of my life to be able to work with him. Well, I'm really glad that I got to ask you about Another Place in Time and Shubop because you're often always asked about Manhattan Transfer, but I want people to know that you have two fabulous albums out where we get to hear you doing your favorite stuff as a solo artist. Hmm. Yes. Now, Alan, you've had some phenomenal experiences in your career. You conquered Broadway. You conquered the worlds of pop and jazz. You've performed at the most important venues in the world. I think you've performed at the White House twice. You've worked with the biggest 
superstars and giants in the music industry. Will you ever sit down and write a memoir? I'm actually in the middle of one. Really? Yes, I'm, I'm working on a memoir. Promise me, Alan, that you'll come back to our show when the book is released. Okay, I'll do that. I would sure. so love to have you come on the show and promote the book. I want to tell our viewers that you can learn more about the Manhattan Transfer, see their concert schedule, and buy their merchandise by going to their official website, manhattantransfer.net. Well, Alan, it's been a real honor to meet you and to have this opportunity to interview you. I've loved your music from day one. I can't thank you enough for taking the time to appear on our show. I know you've just got back from Europe. You're jet lagged. But the time you took to speak with me is greatly appreciated. It was my pleasure. I enjoyed talking with you as well. Thank you. Our guest has been the one and only Alan Paul, here to celebrate the 50th anniversary album and farewell tour of the legendary Manhattan Transfer. If they're coming to a town near you, don't miss the opportunity to see this amazing group live in concert. Take it from me, it's an unforgettable experience. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver. Thank you to Rick and Robin, my wonderful management team in LA at the fabulous Marcelli Company. Thank you to my entire team in the UK. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Bye. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.